Um, so I'll apologize in advance because I don't really quite know what I wanted to do here. So this is basically what happened when we took our large interdisciplinary project that's kind of crazy and all over the place and moved it all on the GitHub and tried to use kind of GitHub tools and GitHub ecosystem. And hopefully some parts will work and I'll highlight that. Some things don't work yet and that's maybe instructional. I'm not sure if I have any advice. This is basically a baseline. So we did this is the gist of it. Uh, but some background on PSAS and rockets and stuff because I think we're pretty cool. Maybe I'm a little biased. Uh, we have this group of, depending on how you count, 50 or 100 people involved at various levels. Sometimes they only come in for launches. Other people are there every week. And it's like half students at Portland State University. It's, we say we're a student club, but the other half of people are just interested uh, part of engineers and, and programmers and just kind of anybody who thinks rockets are super awesome. And they swing by 7 o'clock on Tuesdays at PSU. It's an open group, so everyone's invited. And we've been building this giant rocket that we're holding there. It's uh, like 12, 13 feet tall. I think it's 367 centimeters exactly or something like that. And it's pretty big. And we've stuffed all of these electronics into it. Uh, we've got computers on there. We've got lots of microcontrollers. We have network systems on a rocket. We have Wi-Fi for telemetry. We've got all these custom-built antennas. It's this whole project. Yeah? Is, is there a rocket fuel? There is. There's a little bit at the bottom. Sure. This much is fuel. Um, about that much is electronics. Wow. And the rest is parachutes and recovery material. So this particular rocket, for some background, is a test bed for lifting those electronics. It doesn't really go that far or that fast by rocket standards. It's still pretty cool. It's sitting on the ground, and in 30 seconds, it's about five kilometers above the ground after liftoff, and just barely breaks through Mach 1. So it's supersonic. Um, rocket fuel, loud noises, high G accelerations, all the way up many kilometers in the sky. Uh, and that lets us test all of our kind of ideas for what should fly on rockets. That's to deal with fast moving systems, so really high uh, frame rate um, control systems and this kind of thing. But it's not full on blown NASA rockets, is kind of the point where it's going to go really, really, really far because that actually makes everything a lot harder recovery and the legal part and you know, not recovering it in Idaho, for instance, we can get it right back at the same spot. So this is our little test bed. It's, it's kind of cute, it's kind of small, and just lets us go up and down, go up and down. Yeah? Is that a commercial rocket we can buy off the shelf? The rocket we built ourselves and designed ourselves pretty much from scratch. The motor, though, is actually commercial. We just bought a big rocket motor. It's a little more complicated than that with some tests you have to pass and local clubs that have their own bylaws and rules about launching, but you know, it's more or less an off-the-shelf motor attached to a whole bunch of custom hardware and software and electronics. Um, why did we even bother to do this as a group is, is the usual question we start with. Is um, In like 1997, a bunch of undergraduates at PSU thought that the electrical engineering labs were really boring. And what would be way better than the boring lab is something that might explode or at least involves a lot of fire. And so they said, let's build rockets, and came up with this kind of crazy thing. Well, what's the smallest possible rocket you could build to get some uh, kilogram-ish class satellite to orbit? Um, and at the time, that wasn't even really a thing. That's actually a thing now. CubeSats, the whole standard, it's, one, it's about this big and weighs um, about a kilogram. And you can fly them up to the International Space Station, have them, I believe the scientific term is, hucked into orbit for you. Um, but if you wanted to build one little rocket that just did that, what, what's kind of the, what can you do there? That's an insane thing. So um, you'd have to build some giant steerable rocket. You'd have to get probably as many lawyers by mass as the liftoff weight of the vehicle. And I don't know how many dollars, because there's all kinds of things that get involved here with not so much the fuel. The fuel's cheap. But uh, the materials and the launch site and then all the lawyers and wavering and talking to the State Department to let you do this. And then maybe you'll get to orbit, assuming all the technology magically works. So this is crazy. Um, it's more of a vision statement. And we'll do it, we think, in some number of years. But in the meantime, we're going to prove every single little piece of the technology. And so that's really why we have all this electronics and so little fuel. It's a big technical project 
um, not necessarily practical, but very complicated and interesting. Uh, I usually have this whole thing about why it has to be a steerable rocket and why we have so much computational power on a big rocket motor. Um, I don't really want to get too much into that because it's not what I was going to talk about in the talk. But the basic thing is that um, if you're going to do orbital stuff, you have to follow a very prescribed path. It's not up, it's over. And you have to go up and curve into this path. And depending on the types of fuels and, and everything else, that curve looks different for every type of vehicle. It's the sort of thing you work out, and then you have to actually be able to do. And taking a large hunk of metal that's moving at several kilometers per second and steering it relatively accurately is a very, very difficult problem. And it's one of those things that crosses all the fields, too. So the software design is one thing, but then it's got to run on probably custom hardware, because nobody is building really good embedded systems that are uh, vacuum tolerant and high G tolerant and fly well on rockets and are also cheap and off the shelf and have good data sheets. This is just, you did, can't just get it. Unfortunately, we would love it if we could, but we end up having to develop everything ourselves. And that's where it comes into this whole giant collection of stuff that we need to track somehow and to have issues for and to, to use and share and all this kind of thing. Um, so aside from all the theory, is it real? Yeah, we actually do launch stuff. This is a pretty sweet picture from a launch a couple of years ago. We go out to central Oregon, it's the middle of the desert, it's the middle of nowhere really, and it goes up five kilometers, it comes back, and we analyze all the data, and we change things, and we fly again. A um, couple token videos. Really, the only problem is it's so small, everybody loses it in the camera. You really can't see it. It just goes up so fast. So that's what launches are like. They're, they're really fun. Um, of course, we have video on board. This was one of our controls tests. There's a lot of stuff going on. I could go into it for like an hour. But um, we were trying to control the spin rate using these canards. And in order to decouple all the effects from the, the stabilization of the fins at the back, that's on a free spinning bearing. So it's a thing. <laughs> but it's a pretty sweet view. And uh, right as we top out here, the rocket pitches over a bit, and the parachute comes out. And then it floats back down, and we have uh, a recovery crew that goes and picks it up, and we fly it again. Our current airframe that we're flying uh, a little bit later this year is um, flown five times before. So this will be a sixth flight, all recovered hardware. All right, so running a giant interdisciplinary project on Git, kind of a thing. Um, we have a lot of different repositories because there's just people with different interests. It definitely doesn't make sense for us to stuff it all in the one spot. First off, the repo would be huge. Um, and the first time you'd clone it might take half an hour. For the longest time, we just had a Git web instance. Looks like this if you haven't seen it. Um, you can basically get a web page that gets you a list of the repos. You can click on one, and what you see is that it's a repo and has some history. And I don't even know what's in it. So OK, maybe I look at what the, one of the trees for the rec recent commit. And yeah, it's a list of files. That's about it. And there were a couple problems. One that's ugly, frankly. I mean, it doesn't have that nice pop. You have a new person that comes in doesn't even know much. They're already a little discouraged because it's complicated, and you get this kind of I don't know what's going on thing. Um, and I don't, did not a lot of people had experience anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter. But there's just not that many Git web instances out there that people are using. And so there's a lot of questions like, well, what if I want to contribute? What do I do? Or where's the URL to clone this? Like, if you just look at the, that page, it's never obvious to me what I type in after Git clone to actually get it. Um, because there's some weird URL depending on where we're hosting it. So I didn't like this even though it kind of worked. Um, and I wanted to move everything to GitHub like a year or so ago. And I talked enough people into it that I decided to just kind of do it. And what I came up with is we'll make a big GitHub organization. So you can have user accounts on GitHub, or you can have an organization account, which is kind of meta. You can add users to it. And that got rid of all of our administration overhead, because now you just make a Git. Um, user. Someone goes and makes it themselves. Tell me what your username is. I can just add it to the 
um, permissions. Before, we actually, it was our own server, right? So, okay, email me your public key. I'll go add it to the thing. It's the whole process. Now everyone gets to do it themselves. Um, Learn some interesting things about GitHub doing this, though. We really wanted the short URL PSAS, because that's our name, PSAS. And that was already taken. Someone had a user like that was named gib slash PSAS. So we couldn't take that, except that they weren't using it. And then so I emailed support, because they have a specific uh, rule in their documentation that you can't name squat on GitHub. And they said, yeah, no one's been using it for like a year. We'll just steal it from them and give it to you. OK. Um, so we got GitHub slash PSAS. That was nice. The only problem is we have all these repos. So I started copying everything over, basically just cloning it to my machine and then adding it on GitHub and pushing it. And of course, all the history is in Git, so it just sucks it right out. Except I did this all in one day, and I triggered one of their bots, and it cut out all the access off because it thought it was spam, because suddenly someone was adding you know, 20 repos to this thing in, in a couple of hours. So I'd email them again, and like, OK, no, we really are just moving stuff over. And in all those cases, they were really nice and got back within like a day or something. So it was pretty good. Yeah? No, you can interrupt at any point. Yes. As long as, so for GitHub, as long as you're public, everything's public and all of our stuff is open source, they aren't charging for anything yet that I can tell. Um, so organizations are free, as many repos as you want, as many users as you want. Um, it's just if you add them all at once, they will think that you're a spam bot. Um, we had this sort of question, though. There was a bunch of repos, 10 or 15, that really weren't relevant anymore. They hadn't even been updated in three years. They were from past rockets. Do we even bother to move them? And if we do, what do we do with the old ones? Because now they're kind of in two spots, but one's not going to be updated anymore. And I decided to just move everything, because GitHub actually shows the list of repos by when they were last updated. So just by nature, all the old ones will float to the bottom or sink to the bottom. And I guess that's fine. It's, they're all just kind of there. The thing that we did is we made it so that you couldn't push to the old ones anymore. So we added a pre-receive hook, uh, which is a GitHub hook, or a Git hook to our old stuff, and just made it tell you, hey, go use GitHub. So that little code snippet there, if you drop that in as the file named pre-receive and make it executable, will because it's exiting one there, not let you push to it and tell you to go use the other one. So that was a good way to kind of remind everyone. Because then if someone forgot to change their URLs over, well, actually, next time they try to push, we'll get bumped and say, no, 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 go do this. So that was good. Um, I think the initial reactions were something of confusion, but it's kind of better, I guess. So it was good. Um, it was. It wasn't that much work to move everything over. There was the whole initial, well, where am I pushing to anymore? But after that, it was like, OK, well, it's just a new place that I'm pushing to. And so kind of we didn't care. We also didn't really jump onto the bandwagon and start using all of the whole GitHub tool set right away. Uh, it just kind of evolved naturally. Um, but one of the big things that you get right away with GitHub that I thought was important and I started pushing off the bat is that they render a file named readme if it's in the root of the directory. So if you have a readme file that's like markdown or text style or some even plain text, doesn't really matter, that's what you see. So instead of GitWeb where you log in, you just see, yeah, it's a repo and here's some commits, you see this big rendered text file that has whatever you have in the readme, which is really good for introducing people when they first see a repo. If they don't know what we're doing. They come in, OK, what's the embedded systems code look like? Well, here's a bunch of instructions because it's rendered right there on the page. And that was good. So none of our repos even had readmes before, or except one or two. So actually made all of them have read readmes now, and that was a big thing. And GitHub kind of forces that on you, or it wants you to do that. And I think that's important. Um, eventually, I also started adding some other documentation, namely read the docs, which I'm a pretty big fan of. Um, works best for Python, unfortunately. So if you're doing anything other than Python, you can still use it. It's not quite as good, because it doesn't have all the nice deep hooks down into your code and automatic things. There's probably a talk about read the docs at some point in the conference. I didn't read the whole schedule. Uh, so if you want to know a lot more about that. But the idea is you can add a, it'll automatically add a hook if you make a read the docs account. And every time you change the documentation, all the rendering gets redone for you when you push. So it's kind of this nice connected thing. Um, you don't have to remember to update any pages. It just does it for you. So one of the things we do with 
our project at PSAS is try to get students involved, especially with the capstone groups. So at Portland State, you're required to do a capstone project, kind of like a senior project, as part of, I think, almost all the engineering degrees. And we've been collecting up these little groups. What, you, what they do is they get, get talks from five, 10 people from the community that have ideas that they want a group of students to do. Oftentimes, it's businesses. And they say, oh, here, uh, make this part of our app for us, because they get free labor out of it. And the students get experience. Everyone's happy. And so we just acted like one of those outside people, even though we were at PSU. And we've come up with these little projects for the rocket. Um, our current one is improving the test code for our embedded stuff. And we get a group of students that kind of have to do what we say for two, two months, three months, I guess one term-ish. It always feels longer than it is. But um, so that's nice. What do we do with these new groups? Well, I decided that I wanted them to do their own kind of get stuff separately from us so that they would get a lot of good experience out of it. So we have all the main stuff in PSAS repo. And every time we get a capstone, they're their own little project for this set of time. So we make them make a GitHub organization themselves. And then they have to do the admin stuff. The project leader usually figures that out. They have to make accounts, add it to it. And what I've found is, so a lot of students are, are new to Git, and that's one thing. But almost nobody had GitHub accounts. And especially if you're going out and getting jobs now, it's usually pretty important. Almost everyone asks for a GitHub link, right? And since it's also open source, now we have, at the end of the term, a group of students that have this little, at least a section of public commits on GitHub, which is nice to be able to show that off. Another thing that GitHub kind of buys you is a bit of visibility. Um, sure, they could have had those same commits in our Git web thing, but nobody would know, really. So that's pretty sweet. Um, at the end of the term, when they're all done, we just take uh, uh, using the official account and fork their code. So that's the GitHub thing, where it copies it all to your account. And then now we have uh, our own commit access to it. And you can still see all the history. And that's been working pretty well. So I like that when you have little separated groups that you can go back and forth. Here's your little domain. You get to learn how to use GitHub. They can do whatever they want. At the end, we get a finished project. We fork it. Now it's in a part of our group. Um, the real problem is CAD software. Uh, SolidWorks and Eagle are usually what we use. SolidWorks, if you don't know, is a big, really expensive 3D uh, CAD software for mechanical engineering. So people design buildings and spaceships and all kinds of things there. It's very, very feature rich. It's pretty impressive stuff. It's thousands of dollars for license. It's not the sort of thing you just have lying around. But it's kind of standard. Basically, anywhere you go these days, it's SolidWorks, SolidWorks, SolidWorks. And you can check the files in, but they're binary files. And being a big, expensive proprietary software, there's no way to really read it with any open tools, which is unfortunate because the open source tools aren't there yet. They don't have almost any of the, the features you really need. And even the ones that are open source, and even if you could read the files, Git itself is probably not going to know what to do with it. And text diffs are not super helpful for visual things. Um, GitHub has a nice feature, if you don't know, for STL files, which is a kind of rendered 3D object, really popular for 3D printers. And it will show you visual diffs for all your commits for this little object that's changed over time. The problem with STLs is that's, that's the output. That's like the output of your program. It's the final thing. It's not really what you want to check in in the first place, strictly speaking. It's, it's what came out of your CAD software. It doesn't have the measurements and things. It's just a blob of what you made. And so I, that doesn't really work here. For all the electrical engineering stuff, Eagle is a software package for drawing schematics and boards and designing the actual circuit board itself and producing files that you can send to a manufacturer. And it has kind of the same problem. Um, it's not open source, but it is free with some limitations on board size and number of layers. Um, so at least everyone can, can use it. There's package, there are binaries for um, Linux and, and OS X and, and Windows. So pretty much everyone can see Eagle files. But again, you have this checked in thing in Git that Git doesn't really know what to do with. And text diffs don't mean anything, this big XML file. It doesn't tell you what you actually did. Like, oh, I changed that resistor value. It's not obvious. So you lose a lot of the stuff that you get with software. Yeah. Can you reverse changes, though? Does that effectively bring back to Yep. So the, the basic idea of being able to revert or branch and all that works. 
but in software you can see what you actually did, and with all the CAD tools you're in the blind. You can do the revert, or you can do the look at another branch and then close your program, like open again, reload all the files, and try to guess. It gives you undo and it gives you history, but it's it's not visible. You don't get the depth. Yeah. SolidWorks does. It has its own. I think there's more than one. Um, kind of corporate style uh, sharing and backup and history app. It's not meant for the publicity. It's not meant to be published because it's all for internal corporate stuff. I don't know about Eagle. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, Eagle is a little bit small. Um, I think there's much bigger packages that professionals would use for circuit board design instead. Um, Eagle is much more popular with hobbyists, actually. Part of the reason we want to use it is is that so that it's, it's the hobbyist realm who can, people are more likely to, to look at our work since we're more that than corporate. Um, none of them are Git based, they're all their own thing and I don't even know how they work. It's the kind of thing you install and just maybe works or maybe doesn't. And some people have been making third party tools for diffing files. There are third party visual diffs for Eagle. It's not built in to GitHub, you don't get it in the web interface. So it would be something you'd pull a repo and run yourself. And it's like, well, I can already do that. Um, I'm more concerned with what does the front page look like when you go to the repo? Is it reusable? Can outside people and new people immediately see what's going on? And, and largely, that's not the case for any CAD tool. But we still have everything checked in anyway. Um, and there's some question of what to do with these different types of repos, because they are all tied together. There's some commit that has the right mechanical information, the, the actual version that we built versus all the versions where we we're playing around for things like the structure, um, for things like the boards, exactly what layout we had to do a change, you know, was revision one, was revision two, what actually flew has become a question at some point because you see all these changes to all the electronics for instance. Well, what's the one that actually relates to this repo over here that has firmware? And maybe we had to rev the board and rev the firmware. How are they connected? And that's something that's pretty hard and I haven't really figured out how to do right yet because you can't see those connections anywhere. They're done outside of the repos. Both of them are cloned, probably by different people. This is worked on over here. There's collaboration in person sometimes, but um, there's not a node graph that says this piece of firmware went with this version of this board. Yeah. It's just too big. It would be gigabytes. And it wouldn't really make sense. We'd all be stepping on top of each other. So the problem of whoever gets their first wins, and then you have to merge the change because you didn't see, there would be just constant commits. And they'd be on really different spots. They shouldn't cause a merge uh, problem. But it would be really annoying with the number of people committing constantly to one repo. You'd be pulling all the time. There would be dozens and dozens of uh, commit, merge, commit, merge, commit, merge, commit, merge. because person over here didn't pull it right after that one per person pushed it. So I think it makes sense to keep them separate, especially since from a project standpoint, they're very different kinds of projects. Uh, and at this point we have, I think the count something like 45 repos. There's a lot going on. Yeah? That's actually the thing that I've come up with for flights. And it's probably my next slide, I think. But <laughs> No, that's okay. That's, that's basically what I got to, which is, exactly. What, one thing I can do, especially for something very obvious like a flight, which was a big event in time that happened on a known date and involved all the repos, is tag them all. And what I actually think I'm going to do for this flight, and it's new, so we'll see, is I'm actually going to submodule everything. Um, I forget where exactly I was going to talk about that. Uh, in the meantime, we have test data for these intermediate versions. That's a little less clear. And I just realized I should have made tags for at least one of the tests. But um, basically, I, I also wanted to include the data from the test. Oftentimes, we've generated a bunch of data from an instrument that was some version of a, of a board and some version of firmware that made that data. So checking in data is usually pretty bad because, again, big files. And now if you're diffing them, you have to keep track of all those diffs. And the repos can blow up really fast. If you're checking in 25 diffs of a 100 meg file that's binary, 
diff and, and really almost every bit is different because it's new data. That's probably not good um, for your bandwidth and for usability. But it does work. Um, what I think of test state is, okay, it shouldn't change. So pare down everything that you're actually going to use in some analysis. Check in the code that you did the analysis with too, because that's good. And then check in just the one kind of big file. So yeah, there's one big blob that's sitting there. The first time you pull it, it'll take a while. But don't add a lot of changes to it. Um, again, with having different repos, that kind of helps. Yeah. Basically, um, for this test, I really meant pre-launch because um, we do set everything up and record data for like a minute or, or do something like shake it or put it in a shock testing environment. And those are small tests. And they're not the big launch repo that has, okay, this was a launch, here's everything happened to launch. It's the little intermediate snapshots. Yeah. It is, and that's why I don't really know. So, so far what we've done is either use tags, which show up as releases, which is nice, because then when you click the releases tab and get Hub UC, uh, all the named annotated tags. And so we can say like test four, tag everything for that. And then kind of link it like in the readmes, be like, ah, eh, well we use this. Maybe branches make more sense actually. Maybe test four branch, and we can leave the branches off where they were for that test. Um, I'm not really sure, because it is a weird thing to do. You, you have binary data, you, and you have CAD data, and then you have code. How do they all interplay? This is my, my problem, I guess. Um, lots of notes in the readme, basically, <laughs> is what I've been doing. For the launch, oh, eventually, I don't know why I put this here, but eventually we started using one other big piece of GitHub that I did want to mention, which is the issue tracker. And that's been going really well, but it, the adoption has been really slow, and it's just sort of slowly getting going and going, and it's kind of snowballing, which is nice. So there's tr issues that you can turn on for a repo, and it gives you a really basic, and you can add issues, you can add milestones and add them to it. I think I threw in a screenshot. Yeah, it looks like that. And it's pretty sweet right now. Uh, we've, for at least one of our repos, we have like everything we need to do, and it's actually all tagged with which subsystem it attaches to. And there's all these comments, so you get a thread of comments for each one. So I think it's working really well, but not, the real problem is that um, nobody has any clue where to put issues. And I don't really know what the right answer is either. This is our multiple repo problem. Um, so it makes a lot of sense for the firmware repo to, to have really specific firmware problems and have that come up as an issue. Like, hey, there's a bug in this hardware abstraction layer part over here. That's a thing. I've made one meta repo for the launch, which involves everything, and I've put all the big issues there. Like, okay, we need the firmware to work. That's like a generic issue. The really specific thing, there's a bug in this line of code, you can go over there where the code is. Um, so it's not too noisy. If we put all the issues in one spot, I feel like it's a little too noisy, but, um, but what I've created is this problem where nobody knows where to put which issue, and they're not connected together really either. Um, so that's been a kind of medium well working thing. Definitely, definitely not perfect. But for the launch repo, it does look pretty good. There's actual stuff going on. And you can see this sort of slow churning of them being closed and opened, and stuff's getting done eventually. Um, so what does our kind of GitHub look like for us right now? We're at github.com slash psass. There's a big readme in just about every repo that should explain some basic stuff, like how to build it, um, what it kind of does. We actually need to get a lot better of that, of literally explaining what each repo does in a, a good paragraph instead of the sentence like, oh, it does a chip. Like, well, I don't know what that means. Um, we have a bunch of software repos which are using a lot of the GitHub um, ecosystem, I want to call it. So there's all these little plug-in tools that people have written that, that automatically will take the webhooks from GitHub, which is nice, like read the docs, which will let us write some plain text documentation and even include links to which piece of code we want it to, to read the doc strings on. It all builds all out every time there's a commit. So there's always up to date, um, pretty web page with a bunch of documentation. Travis CI is a continuous integration service, so that builds the whole project and runs tests if you have any every time you check it in and has a little badge if it failed or if it's passing that you can stick in the readme. 
and that's been really good. Um, something I'm trying to move towards for the software is to make files to be able to kind of do everything right off the bat. I really want to be able to grab a piece of software, even if it's complicated, not know anything about it, type git clone, and then type make and have the right thing happen. Um, that's really not true very often. And it's hard to get right, because a lot of times there's weird dependencies or some extra thing, or you have to build the folder structure right for the build. I don't know. It's always something. But trying to get that nailed in. And Travis CI actually helps with that a whole lot, because Travis CI just runs automatically. You can give it some configuration, but unless this kind of thing works out of the box, then it will never know how to build it. You can't tell the computer how to build it in person the way that we tell people in person, hey, you need to make this folder first. Um, so, but software has loads of tools. The problem is the tools are all missing for the CAD stuff. So the electrical engineering stuff, the Eagle, doesn't have visibility. One thing would be awesome. You know how you can kind of see the code when you click on a link in GitHub? You, you click on a board file, which is supposed to be all the, where the parts are placed and the, the copper and everything, and you just see like a render, or XML that doesn't tell you. What I'd love to get is a picture. I want to know what that board looks like. And GitHub does have auto, um, visualization tools for a couple of formats. STL, like I mentioned, and GeoJSON now, which is a mapping type thing. So it'll actually render it on a map for you. That's an amazing live preview. CSVs will give you a table view. Um, but CAD stuff, which that's where you really want it. You, don't, you wouldn't yourself export an image of what it looks like and check that in every time. You want that to be done for you. You want to be able to click on it and go, what does this even look like? And you're not going to get that in Go, probably ever. Do you have a question? Yes. Well, diffing is really hard for things like circuit boards. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. I don't think GitHub will ever support it out of the box, though, because it's such a specific thing, and it's not code. It's just that I really, really want that. So I don't know what to do. Like, GitHub gets us all this stuff, like the issue tracker and things I like, and then it's missing pieces for the specific problem we have. Um, it is a project. In fact, there's ways you could solve it, like building your own thing, kind of like Travis C. High that, that reads the webhook and builds it for you, that lives off somewhere else on a server. That would be a kind of big project, though. Uh, maybe it'll be the next capstone. I'll think about that. Uh, and this is just, just like nothing for SolidWorks. Big proprietary thing. We, we checked it all in. It's there, but no visibility, no real diffing, nothing. Yeah. We had Git itself. We didn't have any tools, any visualizations around Git. We, you would just, someone would tell you what the URL was to clone it, because it wasn't even in the web page. Yeah, just writing it up on a wiki. Just a wiki, yeah. Which for the engineering stuff is still the, kind of the best we can do. Um, the current uh, mechanical engineering team that did this really huge, amazing carbon fiber project generated a ton of documentation. And I didn't want to get them into this whole problem. And so I basically told them, do it the way that you're really comfortable with. And they created a bunch of Google Docs that they could all interact with. And so what, they, what we got out of that is a really giant PDF. They saved off each Google Doc and compiled it, which is really nice. But that's very different than the way software works. Really what it would have been awesome is if there was some magic tool <laughs> that showed what was changed each time and everything they were doing in the CAD was checked in, and so you had that automatically create that list of what happened. Um, because that's what we're getting towards with this whole web-hosted Git stuff, is the software gives you almost a story. You can see these nice named commits, and you can see what changed each time. And then for the CAD things, you get still the text commits, but no real visibility into what really happened. You don't get the story the same way. Um, and so we basically, we'd either have to make our own tools or just kind of live with it. So at least you can do tagging and, and branches and stuff, which is nice. Um, so there's a mix of stuff going on. This is what I, my sort of solving thing for the launches, which is to have a meta repo for the launch. And I decided to treat um, submodules as a kind of documentation in this case. So this is a weird use of submodules. I don't know if anyone else thinks of it this way. Um, submodules aren't really working for us for while we're testing things, because everything's changing all the time. I don't want to test against an already checked in version of another repo. I want to test of that change I literally just made 
on this other directory in my computer. Um, so rather than updating the submodule constantly every single time that someone makes a change, we just have it kind of set up and, and you're more or less told in person how it works. You clone two or three things that all have to work together because um, our software has gotten pretty complicated and make changes to all of them and there's some sim links there and it just kind of runs on your computer locally. We check it all back in. However, come launch, I'm going to submodule off every single piece of the rocket. So the CAD that flew, the electronics engineering stuff that flew, each piece of the firmware that flew and the main repo, the other main software repos at the version that actually flew. We're also including some little tags in our firmware that tell you what git commit was in the firmware, which is nice. But um, that way, in the, you can look at it, say, five years from now. Clone this, git init submodule recursive, whatever, the one that clones all the things inside it. Um, and you'll actually have a copy of everything that was flown at the version it was flown. Because in the future, it'll be in some other version. So that I think is nice, but it really feels like documentation to me, not a useful live editing thing. Because of the amount of effort it takes to update submodules is, is a pain. Nobody likes submodules. Oh, sorry. Um, Git has this kind of repo inside a repo thing. So you can make a repo A and have commits to it and everything, and repo B and have a bunch of commits to it. And then you can have repo A inside repo B at some version. So you actually, once you finish cloning it and updating it, it'll just look like another directory in that repo. You, you can CD to it, you can go to there, and there's all the files from the other repo inside it. And there are actually two different Git repos still, but they now one of them knows about the other. Um, I'm actually not sure how to explain it really well. but. It's literally just another Git repo inside another Git repo. And you can go all the way down. It's, you can be recursive. You can add as many back. I don't think you're allowed to add one that's the top level one again inside. But, um, but the important thing about submodules is they don't automatically update. If someone changes somewhere else, that doesn't get magically reflected in the one where it's submodule. So now you have two copies of it. And you have to run commands to update it inside the other one and refresh that. And so while you're testing, like literally while you're doing things in, in time scales of minutes, this is not good. Um, for time scales of years and days or months, it's fine. And so that's why I'm treating it like a documentation thing. So the submodule actually points to not just the repo, but a particular version of that repo, a one single commit. And so I can submodule the commit that flew for chip number four into there and get like a copy of what was flown in one spot, which I think is useful. We'll see if it makes sense or not, or if everyone's confused again. Um, so I feel like <laughs> the secret weapons of the GitHub thing is that it's an ecosystem. So all the little tools that people have built around it that, that use its commits automatically, like Travis CI and Read the Docs. There's probably a bunch of others I'm forgetting. Um, everybody loves the badges, or at least Theo loves the badges, because he talks about them a lot. Um, a lot of those services will then generate a little image that has like a, yay, it's working really well for the ones that run tests. And you can just put that in to the readme. It'll show it, and they'll change the image. The link doesn't change, but the, they have magically flipped the image so that your little badge changes if something happens. So it's almost like a back and forth. And then you get these repos that have these bright colored badges, passing, 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 failed. Um, read the docs is pretty good. Another secret weapon is you can create a branch on any repo in GitHub named gh-pages. It's a special name, and then that will be published, um, and depending on what you do, kind of, it'll try to render things like Markdown with some caveats. You'll have to read the documentation on this. Um, but for the most part, it'll, you can think of it as publishing it to the web. So instead of the GitHub interface, it's the raw files. So if you put an HTML file in there, it's now like a website. So if you go to username.github.io slash the name of the repo, um, it actually looks like a hosted web page. It even has built-in support for a static blog generator called Jekyll, and you can actually build a blog within GitHub in a branch. Um, that's actually quite useful for publishing stuff as you go. Uh, the forks and pull request thing works pretty well. I, I really feel like what I'm getting here is that there's outside visibility, because I was, I mean, I'm pretty good at Git, and I was confused looking at GitWeb. So people who are brand new to it, I think, would have no clue what to do, and certainly I don't think they did. And now GitHub is a known thing. There's lots and lots of documentation on GitHub, and there's lots of people that use GitHub, for better or worse. And so it's like trying to fit in. 
um, you're, if you're using the same looking system, well, I know what to do with this. There's a thing called a pull request. It's a button that GitHub has. I know how to contribute to this project now because it looks like all the other projects. But I think that's important to keep that kind of consistency so that people have an idea what to do. If every single repo looked completely different every time you went to a new project, you'd have to figure out how to do all the things all over again. Um, and the issue tracking has worked pretty well. Uh, the big missing piece is some kind of, is all the meta work. So you see this huge list of repos, but I want to know how they all work together. Um, so this top down, where do I come in and where do I go problem, uh, to how they're all connected, and all the CAD tools. There's not visual stuff for CAD tools. Um, I really like the fact that administration is now easy. I mean, it was actually creating user accounts and and asking people for keys and, and setting up permissions and getting it wrong three times and that kind of thing. And now it's just, oh, tell me your GitHub username. That's great. Uh, the badges are pretty cool. And like I said, the, making everything look the same as everyone else repo to have this sort of sense of I know what to do when I see this. Uh, some funny things that have gotten us kind of in trouble, I think, or gotten me in trouble, is I think email alerts are turned on by default when you create GitHub accounts and when you follow a repo or when you're added to it in an organization. And so I have inadvertently spammed people with like dozens and dozens of emails of like every issue that's been updated because we did a big, you know, push at three in the morning to get a bunch of work done, and I got a lot of complaints on that. It's like, well, okay, go turn them off then, I guess, or write a filter. I don't know. Um, maybe those should be off by default. Uh, the whole where is issue for this, where is this thing live? The, no one knows where anything is anymore. It used to at least all be on a wiki, which was confusing, but it was all on a wiki. Now it's in 20 different repos. Maybe that's a problem. Um, and then we started using GitHub, but then not updating the wiki, which is sort of my fault. And so I get a lot of people, oh, you don't even update the website anymore. Well, no, if you look at GitHub, there's like all of this data about everything we've changed and the issues that are open and closed, and it's constantly streaming in. Yeah, but I went and looked at the wiki, and there's nothing there. It's like, oh, OK. So we've got to figure out how to bring it back in. Um, so that's kind of what I had. Like I said, there wasn't, I didn't know what I was trying to say. But that was our experience with GitHub. Uh, we have a launch, which is exciting, in about 25 days and 22 hours from now. Um, and it's in the middle of Oregon. Uh, it's pretty cool. Well, hopefully, we'll be tweeting about it and the images and video and stuff. Uh, if you want to come hang out where we meet every Tuesday at 7, um, or you know, check us out or find me, et cetera, et cetera, it's a public group. Everyone's welcome to come participate. And uh, if you come hang out, you can come to the launch. Uh, so that's our main GitHub page. That's the wiki that we never update anymore, but has some past information. And we have a Twitter account that also is rarely used. And I think I'm out of time. So that's basically it. Oh, yeah. The meta here is, of course, you can clone this. <laughs> because that's always good. I don't know what happens now. Is there time for more well, discussion? Uh, okay, sure. Oh, uh, I don't know what a lot of the big companies do, and I, I guess I should really ask. I just assumed they wouldn't tell me, but I do know some of the equip, some of the big ones. Uh, they even advertise. Siemens has a big fancy software system. And I've seen a couple instances of it. I don't actually know what everyone does, though. Did they write that, or is that a thing? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to look it up. Uh, OK. Yeah. That's good. I'd be interested to know more about that. The thing with that is we look into that. It works for very small companies. And, um, like the two I know from the CAD, the circuit design side, um, there are two fantastic, well, frustrating, but very, very capable programs, um, Ultium and the S2 Design Side. And mm -hmm. those two, I mean, that's $10,000 starting just to get one license. Which is our entire budget for like three years, yeah. for the record. Mm -hmm. So not going to happen. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm trying to remember which one that was. I have been trying to follow a lot of the open science thing, which I didn't really get to. There's the idea of doing science on Git, which is a thing, but but it's really early, I feel like. All of the stuff I've seen is still really early. I think so. I know. It would be really weird to have all the stuff, uh, pictures of launch, and then go, well, what actually happened? Oh, I don't know. We didn't check that in. Yeah. Oh, they want to see. That's how I feel. I've seen lots of projects that are in their opening stages, and they, they have some ideas, but partly the, there's no adoption yet, and it's a chicken and egg kind of thing where, well, nobody's using it, so I don't want to use it. But it's also a lot of lack of maturity in the tools. Um, I don't know. We're publishing everything on GitHub, which I hope helps. It, it felt a little siloed before, and at least it's more public now or, or more visible.